Uh, hello everyone, welcome to our fifth talk, I think, on the Irish Revolution. Tonight we're going to be hearing from Karen Lennon about the North East, and specifically Belfast during the Irish Revolution. Uh, a few words on this before we start. Um, Belfast was the, either the second or the third most violent place in the Irish Revolution, after Cork, or Dublin if you count the Rising, ahead of Dublin if you don't count the Rising. And yet Belfast is mostly forgotten in the history of the Revolution, which is unusual. So, the history of this period in Belfast uh, falls into, I think, one of two traps. The first one is that it's forgotten about altogether. And the second one, I think, which is equally bad in a way, or equally distorted, is that it's viewed through the prism of post-1969 and the Troubles. And the two areas are really not the same. And just Kieran will fill you in in more depth, but just two things to consider, which is that when Irish Republicanism was being revived in the early 1900s, one of the leading lights was Bomer Hobson, who was a Quaker from County Down, which gives you an idea of, of that it's a different era. And the other major thing which totally alters the landscape is that the RIC the police force was 90% Catholic. It's certainly in its, its rank and file. So it's a different place and a different time. Um, so the, the title here is Pogrom or Civil War. Um, the reason for this is that at the time, Catholics, as Kieran will say, suffered disproportionately for the, from this violence. And at the time, in Nationalist Ireland, it was known as the Pogrom. Okay, which is a term taken from Eastern Europe and from uh, assaults on the Jewish population there. Now, at the time and since it was known as the pogrom, an attack on the Catholic population of Belfast, the counter thesis is that it was a type of civil war that Catholics and Protestants killed each other. So Kieran's going to talk about those two ideas. Okay, on Kieran himself, Kieran, uh, I think, is the first of our contributors who has a direct family link with what he'll be talking about because his grandfather, Tom Glennon, was in the Belfast IRA of the period. Now, we didn't spend that much time in Belfast, as Kieran will talk, but um, he ended up actually in County Donegal in the National or Free State Army in the Irish Civil War, another story there. But Kieran has, has written a book about this. It's over here. You can pick up a copy later if you want. It's called From Pogrom to Civil War. And it's the story of Tom Glennon. It's also the story of Belfast in the period of the Irish Revolution. Uh, Kieran originally hails from Belfast, but has been in Dublin for a very long time. <laughs> and so without further ado, um, I'm going to hand you over to Kieran Glennon. Thanks, John. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm going to start by um, answering the question that's in the title of the talk, um, Pogrom or Civil War. And the answer I'm going to give, at this point anyway, is that it was neither. The definition of the pogrom from the Oxford English Dictionary is it's an organised massacre of a particular ethnic group. Massacre is debatable. Organised is the, the part that I would quibble with. It wasn't organised, at least in its initial phase, um, certainly not officially, certainly not by the authorities, um, although, as I'll explain later on, the authorities did have involvement as things progressed. As regards the, the definition of civil war, um, two people whose names I didn't write down said a civil war is defined in three parts. Firstly, the violence must be civil, and by that they meant that it takes place within a national territory, largely between the people of that territory. Obviously, it must be a war, and the aim is the acquisition or exercise of national authority in that territory. And where this, the events of 1920-22 fall down is, is on the first part of the definition in relation to territory, because Northern Ireland didn't exist when the conflict up there started. Ireland at that stage was still a single unit, governed from London, administered from Dublin. There was no Northern Ireland. So I define the conflict up there as the war of independence as it was fought in the north. Now after that, I would say, you've got to forget all you know about the war of independence in relation to the south, because I'm, as I'm going to make the point repeatedly, what happened in the north was different. Now, as John has mentioned, the word pogrom was used commonly at the time, so I'm going to use it as well. I'm going to concentrate mainly, but not exclusively on Belfast, because that's where most of the main events happened. So, when and how did it begin? Well, immediately you run into the same problem as with everything in the north. You split into two camps of they started it. And so the, the origins are disputed. You could go all the way back to the plantations in the 1600s. I'm going to stay in the 20th century. And the most obvious um, fault lines were there because of the home rule crisis. <coughs> you had two camps in direct opposition to each other, unionism and nationalism, each of which had their, their own wing. 
UDF and the Irish Volunteers, respectively. So the, the, the fault lines were in place from the Home Rule crisis. If you move forward to 1916, there was no element of the Easter Rising in Belfast. However, the, the volunteers, the Irish volunteers who were in Belfast, under the leadership of Dennis McCullough, went to Dungannon. And McCullough was under strict instructions from the IRB Supreme Council. Literally, he was told, not a shot to be fired in Ulster. Unfortunately, McCullough disobeyed his orders to the extent that the poor man shot himself in the, in the hand on Easter Saturday night. They got to Dungannon, met the, the local volunteers there, and then there was a disagreement and debate because of McNeil's countermanding order. They were supposed to originally march to Galway, link up with Lane Meadows. They couldn't decide what to do. In the end, the Belfast men went home. After 1916, in the north, the volunteers, just like down here, reorganised um, and got back into drilling and training. <coughs> now, I said there was two camps in the north. In the, in the north, there was almost a, a third camp because you had the added dimension, which was the enduring strength of the old Irish Parliamentary Party, the Nationalist Party, as it was known there. Um, it was led by Joe, Dev Joe Devlin, who was the Grand Master of the Engine Order of Hibernians. We're used to thinking in terms of the 1918 general election as being a landslide for, for Sinn Féin. They wiped out the old parliamentary party of Redmond and Dillon and so on. The North was different. In the constituency of Belfast Falls, you had the Grand Master of the AOH, Joe Devlin, opposed by the President of Sinn Féin, Emma de Valera. You had Sinn Féin election workers beaten up on the Falls Road, not something that you would tend to come across these days. And despite all his credentials relating back to 1916, De Valera was beaten out of sight. Devlin outpolled De Valera by nearly three to one. <coughs> As an illustration of how much republicanism was, with, was a minority within the nationalist camp, an RIC monthly report for Belfast estimated that there were 980 members of Sinn Féin in nine branches, and there were 8,000 members of the AOH organised in 25 what they called divisions. <laughs> so, we move forward from the 1918 election to 1920. You had municipal elections in January of that year, and across the nine counties of Ulster, 23 local authorities came back with nationalist majorities, 22 with unionist majorities. Most significantly, Derry City Council fell to the nationalists for the first time. So obviously this set alarm bells ringing among unionists. The War of Independence had been going on for about a year at this stage, but the, the North was largely untouched. In March 1920, you had an attack on Ballon the Hinch Barracks. In June, there was an attack on Crossgar Barracks. There's a couple of notable things about it. Both of these attacks took place in County Down, but they were mounted by the Belfast Battalion. And that, that suggests two things. One, it points to the weakness of the IRA outside of Belfast. It also points to the nervousness of the IRA about acting in Belfast for fear that they were trigger reprisals. Now at Easter 1920, um, GHQ in the IRA, GHQ in Dublin, sent out an order that to mark the anniversary of the Easter Rising, tax offices all across the country were to be burned down. And the same thing happened in Belfast. Two tax offices were burned. It was part of this national war effort. You move forward to June, at this point you're into the marching season, and you get exchanges of shots in Derry, 19 people are killed, and then a truce is brokered by local clergymen. The following month, two key events in July really ignite the North. <coughs> First of all, on the 12th of July, the end of the Orange Parade, Edward Carson made a speech, and he said, we must proclaim today clearly, come what will, and be the consequences what they may, that we in Ulster will tolerate no Sinn Féin, no Sinn Féin organisation, no Sinn Féin methods. And these are not mere words. I hate words without action. This obviously stoked the tensions. A few days later, the IRA in Cork killed a Lieutenant Colonel, Gerald Bryce Ferguson Smith, who had some months previously caused a mutiny in Trilly RAC barracks, where he basically encouraged the police to adopt a shoot to kill policy. He was originally from Brown from Ban Bridge in the north, so his funeral was to be held there. There was a delay for a couple of days because railway men down here refused to bring the body back north. A 
eventually they did. After the funeral, rioting broke out in Land Bridge, it spread to Dromor, and then it spread to Belfast. Now, for those of you not familiar with the geography of Belfast, either today or in 1920, the map here is to, to try and show you where, where things happened. The 20th of July is generally taken as being the start date of the pogrom. And on that day, 8,000 workers were expelled from workplaces across Belfast. It began, began at lunchtime in the shipyards here on the left-hand side. Um, workers were beaten up, some were thrown in the lagging. The expulsion spread to Mackey's Engineering on the Springfield Road over on the very left-hand side, <coughs> to the Serapo work, Rope Works in Ballymacarrot, to Gallagher's Tobacco in York Street. Now, it's worth stressing that while 8,000 people were put out of work, they weren't all Catholics. Um, about one-fifth to a quarter of those expelled were what were known as rotten prods. These were trade unionists, socialists, people whose loyalty to the Crown was felt to be in as much doubt as Catholic nationalists. When the shipyard workers came home from work at the end of the day, they passed down past Barry McCurrent, St. Matthew's Church, rioting broke out there. They got the trams back over to Shankill and the rioting sp spread to the Clonard area. Where was the IRA in this? Initially, they tried to stay outside what one officer described as the usual fratricidal strife. And that meant that a key role in quelling the disturbances and protecting Catholics from attack was actually played by the British Army. So, for example, in the riding around Clannard Monastery, the army was responsible for all but one of the ten deaths in that early riding. Four Protestants, six Catholics. Now, I'm going to try and avoid drawing parallels with the, the modern troubles that started in 1969, but I will make one point. The, the riding in Clannard mainly happened along Kashmir Road. Kashmir Road ends at one end of it, it has a junction with Bombay Street, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. The 22nd of August, the IRA poured further fuel in the fire. They killed District Inspector Oswald Mosley, or sorry, Oswald Swansea in Lisburn. Now, Swansea had been indicted by an inquest into the death of the Cork Lord Mayor, um, Tom Austin Curtin, the previous March, as being one of those responsible for killing the Lord Mayor. Two men came up from Cork and they agreed with the Belfast men that the first shot would be fired from the Lord Mayor's pistol. This happened, Swansea was killed, there was rioting immediately afterwards in Lisburn, the UVF was mobilised, a thousand Catholic families fled from the town in the next couple of days. The following Sunday in Lisburn, nine Catholics attended mass. Belfast erupted again. And this far, like you could describe the violence maybe had tacit support and encouragement from the likes of Carson and so on, but it wasn't officially organised. It was primarily a mob response to IRA actions. <coughs> the following month, September 1920, you had a new dimension added with what became known as the murder gang. On the 25th of September, Constable Leonard was killed at the junction of the Falls and Broadway. The IRA, short of guns, had to get guns by disarming the police. He struggled, was killed. That night, a curfew was declared, which meant that anyone out after 10 o'clock obviously had to be up to no good or a member of the police. Sometimes they were both. That night, three men were killed in their homes by the police. Ned Trodden, who had been a volunteer, who was out in 1916. Sean Gaynor was an officer in the IRA. Sean McFadden was not an IRA member at all. The police gang responsible was initially led by District Inspector Harrison, and this was the start of a pattern of police reprisals for IRA actions. Now, just to, to reiterate the point that what was going on in the North was part of a wider war of independence, that autumn, GHQ, the IRA in Dublin, was intent on stepping up its operations outside Belfast across the North, so they appointed a number of full-time organisers. A man named Charlie Daly from Kerry was sent up to organise in Derry and Tyrone. Sean Cusack, who had been the OC of the Belfast um, Battalion, was sent to organise East Down. And his adjutant was sent to organise County Antrim. And here I have to uh, mention the family interest because the man that was sent to County Antrim was my granddad, Tom Glennon. 
Now, if you've read Ernie O'Malley's book, On Another Man's Wound, you see the kind of activities that um, organisers were engaged in recruiting, drilling, training, teaching the local um, members of the IRA to learn by doing. So, for example, in Antrim, you had raids for arms in the Coast Guard stations, you had attacks on barracks, you had ambushes on patrols, and so on. The IRA was stepping up its activities, so were the British. At the instigation of James Craig, you had the formation of the Ulster Special Constabulary. <coughs> now, there were three classes of specials. The A specials were full-time. They worked alongside the regular police under the command of the, the normal police officers. The B specials were part-time, which meant that they mainly operated at night and in the evening. They had their own command structures, so they were in separate platoons with their own officers, not commanded by the regular police, so they could be a force unto themselves, if you like. The C specials were more or less harmless Isle fellas who could be trusted to, try to guard the likes of the waterworks, the tram depots, and so on. But it was the B specials that were the ones that were to become the most notorious. And because in the north you had the, the specials, three classes of specials, the black and tans and the auxiliaries were never deployed in the north because they had the specials instead. <coughs> the city quietened down in November and December. There were no killings. In early 1921, there was a change of leadership in the, the Belfast Brigade of the IRA, and a, a younger, more aggressive set of officers came to the fore. They formed an active service unit, which is more or less like an urban equivalent of a flying column. And they launched a series of attacks in the city centre, targeting police who regard a witness in the trial of an IRA man, auxiliaries who had come up from Dublin to collect vehicles, black and tans who were on leave. And through the series of attacks on the police, eight policemen were killed in the spring. And these were very similar to what was happening in Belfast and Cork. After the last of those attacks, the police murder gang struck again. Two brothers, Dan and Pat Duffin, were killed in their home. Now, Dan was an officer in the IRA, Pat wasn't. The next morning, District Inspector Ferris, who had also been named in the McCurtain inquest verdict, as having been involved, D.I. Ferris called to the house to collect a dog that the killers had, been, had left behind. The IRA tried to kill Ferris, he shot him in the head in, in May, but he, he survived. The following month, they did succeed in killing Constable Glover, who was also a member of this police murder gang. That night, the murder gang, now led by District Inspector Nixon, they struck again, and they killed three Catholics in particularly gruesome circumstances. One man was beaten with rifle butts, dragged across a barbed wire fence, shot 17 times, and his testicles torn out with a bayonet. So now you have three strands to the violence. The sectarian rioting has resumed, the IRA is attacking the police, and the police are taking the prizes. In the summer of 1921, there's two key events. First of all, the Government of Ireland Act, which had been passed in 1920, came into effect. <coughs> And this, almost a year after the trouble had started, was the official partition of Ireland. Elections were held in May, and the Parliament was opened by the King in June 1921, and James Craig was appointed Prime Minister. Second major event, as you know, of 1921 in the summer, was the War of Independence came to an end with the truce. And the truce was announced on the 9th of July to come into effect on mid midday of the 11th. The North was different. Roger McCorley, who by now was the OC of the Belfast Brigade, said, the pogrom lasted two years, the truce itself lasted six hours. There were three things about the truce. First, the timing. In the context of the North, it would come into effect the day before the 12th, and the 11th night is the night when big, huge orange bonfires are lit in preparation for the next day's parades. So the timing was disastrous in the context of the North. One of the provisions of the, the truce arrangement was that the base specials were to be demobilised. And the implication of the truce generally was, from a unionist point of view, it looked like those feelings were getting their way. The night of the 9th of July, the night that the truce was announced, an IRA picket in the Lower Falls intercepted an RIC crossing on Ragland Street, killed a policeman and two. This was another attack suspected by the, the murder gang. The police in the lorry 
were only armed with revolvers, not the usual rifles, and they were wearing tennis shoes instead of the normal boots. Thirdly, Raglan Street was where the intelligence officer of the IRA's Third Northern Division lived. Belfast erupted again the next day. McCorley said, the British, especially the Special Constabulary, seemed to be completely out of hand and bent on massacre. Armoured cars passed through all our areas and kept up continuous fire into the houses. Anything moving, man, woman or child, was fired on. A heavy concentration of snipers kept up a continuous fire into the nationalist areas. On that day, there was 14 people killed, 10 Catholics. That violence continued all throughout the rest of the summer and into the autumn, and only at the end of October did Owen O'Duffy, first commissioner of the Garda, blue shirts and so on, he had been appointed by the IRA as a truce liaison officer for the whole of Ulster. At, only at the end of October did he agree to take back the IRA pickets from national series. Now, take a pause to, accept, to assess the impact of the violence up to now. Up to this point, from July 1920, there have been 164 people killed in Belfast. And you can see there's two main, main peaks. One, the violence at the outset in the Kim and Swansea, and secondly, in the summer of 1921, um, around the opening of Parliament and the Raglan Street ambush. Now, if you crudely split it into sides, and here I'm defining the nationalist side as being the IRA and Catholic civilians, and the unionist side as being military, police, specials, Protestant civilians. Catholics were a quarter of the population of Belfast, so the law of averages would say there should be about a quarter of the the casualties were more or less half and half, 80 nationalists, 84 unionists. This was up to the pickets being withdrawn. This happened in November. It was the worst month since the start of the troubles for killings in Belfast, while the truce is supposedly in place, while the treaty and negotiations were going on. <coughs> Two factors involved. In November, the Northern Ireland government, which had been elected the previous June, it was given responsibility for policing and security, and immediately they remobilised the specials. Now, contrary to what some accounts would have you believe, this was not simply a case of them rearming the old pre-war UVF. There's a history of the UVF written, and the, the, the historian reckons that after the First World War, the, the UVF had only small numbers, maybe a maximum of 3,000. However, you had bigger loyalist militias had started up, the Cromwell clubs, and especially the Imperial Guard, they were absorbed into the specials. The second thing that happened was, in November, the IRA began mounting more nakedly sectarian attacks, not just on the police. So, for example, they bombed two trams in the city centre that were carrying shipyard workers home to the Shankland and to North Belfast, and seven people were killed in those tram bombings. The next month, of course, you had the treaty signed on the 6th of December, which copper fastened partition it didn't institute it. That had been done by the government of Ireland. Act. The reaction of the Northern IRA was not what you might expect, and it was not what some of the historians imply. This is a photo of some senior IRA officers in Belfast, taken in early December 1921. And you can see from their faces, despite partition being reinforced, there's an amount of jubilation. <coughs> the man that's turned in from the, the right wearing the uniform is Joe McKelvey. He was uh, the OC at the 3rd Northern Division. He attended a meeting in Clonus the night after the treaty was signed, where all the, the IRA leaders from the North gathered, and they were assured by Owen O'Duffy that the treaty held no threat to them, that they had nothing to worry about. Now, McKelvey is remembered as being one of the four anti-treaty leaders captured in the Fall Courts who was executed in Mount Joy in December 1922 in the However, at this point, McKelvey is not anti-treaty. Just before Christmas, Dennis McCullough was released from jail and he had a meeting with Joe McKelvey, with McKelvey's adjutant, James Woods, and the intelligence officer, Frank Crumley. And the four of them reviewed the situation as it stood in Belfast and agreed unanimously to accept the treaty, subject to conditions. <coughs> On St Stephen's night, 1921, McKelvey and McCullough met Michael Collins and Arthur Griffith just down the street there in the Gresham Hotel, <coughs> and they presented their conditions, which Collins accepted. The chief among these was that there was to be no further recognition of the Northern Ireland government, 
a boy Belfast boycott, which had been instituted in September 1920, whereby Northern businesses that were union so were boycotted in the South, that was to be reviewed, and a relationship or what standing was to be between the new provisional government in the South and the Northern Ireland government, that was to be defined. The important implication of this meeting with Collins is that Collins now knew that the loyalty of the Northern Ireland IRA and their adherence to the treaty was conditional. Now, this is where we left the death toll up to the signing of the treaty, and this is what happened afterwards. After the treaty, the first major development was that the provisional government in the South began to get involved as champions for Northern Nationals. And at the end of January, you had the signing of what was known as the first Craig Collins Pact. There were some important um, aspects to this. First of all, the Boundary Commission that was established by the Treaty was supposed to have one representative each for the Provisional Government, the Northern Ireland Government and the British Government of Westminster. Collins and, and Craig agreed they would dispense with the British representative and just have a two-man show. What this meant was that the Unionist representative could no longer be outvoted but would effectively have a veto on how the, the Commission um, behaved. Secondly, Collins agreed to discontinue Belfast boycott. In return, Craig made promises about reinstating the expelled workers. The, the pact broke down in a couple of days over the interpretation of what, the role, what role the Border Commission was going to play. Collins, along with pretty much every nationalist in Ireland, expected Tyrone, Fermanagh, South Armagh, South Down, Derry City would all be handed over to the Free State, making Northern Ireland unviable. Craig was adamant, not an inch. Over the next while, after the pact, <coughs> the focus of events moved out of Belfast and the border areas. It began with the arrest of what were known as the, the Monaghan footballers. Ostensibly, these were men who were going to watch a GAA match in Derry. Now, the authorities suspected that they were actually going to Derry to spring um, a jailbreak involving three men who were in jail under death sentence. One of those arrested was Dan Hogan, who was the OC of the 5th Northern Division, and he was very much Owen O'Duffy's protege. So in response to these arrests, O'Duffy arranged the kidnapping of more than 40 prominent Unionist specials and so on by IRA units who came over from the south across the border and brought them back south. That happened on the 7th and 8th of February. A couple of days later, he had what was known as the Clones of Frey on the 11th. <coughs> A train carrying specials from their depot in Newton Arts to Enniskillen had to come through Southern Territory. It stopped in Clonus. The local IRA were alerted, went down to the station. A shootout took place in the train. Four specials were killed along with the IRA commander. This provoked uproar in Belfast. Two days later, there was a revenge attack. A grenade was thrown at a group of Catholic children that were playing in Weaver Street in North Belfast. Two of the kids were killed, and four more died later. And this violence in Belfast continued to grow and grow, escalating during March, and culminated on the 23rd of March. At lunchtime, two specialists were killed in the markets near the city centre. And that night, publican Owen McMahon, three of his sons, a barman who worked for him by the name of Edward McKinney, were all killed in McMahon's home off the Antrim Road. His youngest son, Michael, only survived by pretending to be dead. The remaining son, John, was shot. He survived, but he committed suicide some years later. Apparently, he was wracked with guilt at having survived the annihilation of the rest of his family. And the McMahon family killings caused horror and outrage internationally. At Westminster, Lloyd George said to Churchill, our Ulster case is not a good one. And under the impact of Churchill, the colonial secretary, a second Craig Collins Pact was agreed at the end of March. <coughs> the first line in the document is what said up at the top. Peace is declared, is today declared. This would turn out to be wild optimism, badly placed. The, the second pact brought in important changes in policing, and there was almost as a tacit admission of the role the specials had played um, up to now. From now on, specials, patrols in mixed areas were to be 50-50 Catholic and Protestant. All police arms had to be kept in the barracks. There was no more specials bringing their guns home. 
and a policing committee drawn from both sides was to be set up. Now here you would have to forgive the Unionists for not quite trusting Michael Collins bona fides because one of his nominees to this policing committee was the intelligence officer of the Belfast IRA. The hopes for peace that were in this document proved forlorn the next day. A constable Turner was killed on the Old Lodge Road. In disputed circumstances, the police was said it was shot from the Catholic Stanhope Street. The British Army had a, a patrol on the Old Lodge Road. They said there was no firing from that street. The IRA did an investigation and said it was shot from Brown Square Barracks. Regardless of who was responsible that night, there was another reprisal by the police and specials. They killed one man in his house in Stanhope Street. They went around the corner to Park Street, killed another man there. Then they broke into a house in Arnold Street. In Arnold Street, these, the, the, these events are known as the Arnold Street killings, although they didn't all happen in Arnold Street. This is a testimony of somebody who survived in the first house in Arnold Street. <coughs> On the night of 1st of April 1922, I was in bed with my grandfather. My grandmother was buried that day, and we went to bed at 6 o'clock. At 11 o'clock, two men came into the room. One was in the uniform of a policeman. They asked my grandfather his name, and he said, William Spall. The man in plain clothes fired three shots at my grandfather. When I cried out, he said, lie down or I will put a bullet in you. This man snatched the money that my grandfather had to settle up the expenses of my grandmother's funeral. It was 20 pounds. I was 12 years old on the 11th of February last. I know that if I tell a lie, I will go to hell. I could recognize the man in plain clothes. I had seen him before on the old lodge road. Next, they broke into the house next door. Joseph Walsh was not shot. He was bludgeoned to death with the sledgehammer with which they broke down the door. His seven-year-old son was in bed beside him. He was shot and died the next day. Now, what's noticeable from all these attacks by the, the, what was called the murder gang, they were not afraid to leave witnesses. You go back to the first attacks in September 1920, Sean Gaynor's mother saw him killed. You had D.I. Ferris calling to collect the dog after the Duffin brothers. The man who was bayoneted, the next day, District Inspector Nixon called to the house to give his condolences to the widow. She recognised him as being the leader of the man of the police who had taken away her husband. In the McMahon family killings, McMahon's wife, daughter and daughter-in-law were all in the house um, when the killings took place. After the Ireland Street killings, Mrs. Walsh, widow of the man who was killed in bed, went to do an identity parade in the police station. The police men stationed in the barracks refused to attend um, the identity parade. She was on her way out, and in the hallway she recognised head constable Giff and said, that's the man who killed my husband. She was thrown out of the station. So it's obvious that the, the police murder gang weren't just acting with impunity, they weren't worried about witnesses because they knew in practical terms they had immunity. Now that's not to say that sectarian attacks were totally one-sided. For example, off York Street in, in North Belfast, the IRA lined up workers in a cooper's yard, asked everybody their religions. The one Catholic was told to stand aside, and four Protestants were shot. <coughs> I want to move on now and look at um, Michael Collins and his relationship with um, popular accounts of, of Collins say that he used a mixture of diplomacy and aggression in dealing with the, the Northern Ireland government. Diplomacy in the form of the, the Collins Credit Pacts, aggression as regards like, the border kidnappings, and mainly the fact that he sent guns to the Northern IRA. <coughs> as I said, the border kidnappings were actually organised by Owen Duffy. And in relation to the arms shipments, we really got to understand them by looking at the background. At the end of March in 1922, you had the holding of an IRA army convention. And this was the formal split in the IRA. The anti-treaty element formed the army executive. Roger McCorley, the OC of Belfast, was going to go anti-treaty um, because the, the executive had promised him guns. Owen O'Duffy basically <coughs> won a Dutch auction for who could promise the most guns to Belfast. and. As a result of that, McCorley advised the rest of the Northern Ireland leadership to stay with the pro-treaty GHQ. <coughs> Shortly after the convention, there were a number of other developments, which meant that Collins 
all of a sudden was at risk of being a fount of murder. First of all, Joe McKelvey, at by this stage, had gone anti-treaty. He was elected onto the anti-treaty army executive. The executive reinstated the Belfast boycott that Collins had suspended the previous January. On the same day that the four courts were occupied, the anti-treaty forces also occupied Fowler Hall, which was at number 10 on the other side of what, the square here. Fowler Hall was the Dublin HQ of the Orange Order. And very symbolically, they occupied it and turned it into a refugee centre for Catholics who were fleeing the Belfast violence. <coughs> the pressure of these events meant Collins had to protect his northern flank, and he agreed a joint plan in secret with the anti-treaty IRA. Now, in book, I call this plan the Army Unity Strategy, and that's really because its main function was to act as glue to prevent the two halves of the IRA from splitting asunder. The plan wasn't just formulated with the anti-treaty leaders who were in the forecourts. In part, it was formulated at meetings in the forecourts attended by Collins, Mulcahy and O'Duffy. Um, now, you note that if, um, apart from holding leading military positions, all three of these also held leading roles in the Irish Republican Brotherhood. All three were on the Supreme Council. Collins and O'Duffy were both on its three-man executive. Collins, of course, was the president. And that's, the reason I put that there is because the IRB at this point, even after the split, is still an important conduit between the pro and anti treaty um, sides. <coughs> and in fact, a lot of the leaders on the anti treaty side were also on the Supreme Council. The plan they put together are three elements. First of all, the anti treaty IRA would send men north. Secondly, Collins would send arms and ammunition to the Northern IRA having swapped British supply guns that had been given to the provisional government with the Munster IRA to avoid any guns being traceable back to him. When all these preparations were complete, there was to be an uprising by the whole of the Northern IRA, not just the divisions that were inside the North, but including divisions whose territory or area of operations <coughs> was mainly in this side of the border, but also partly in the North. So you had the first Northern Division in Donegal and Derry, the 1st Midland Division, which was responsible for parts of Fermanagh, the 5th Northern in Cavan and Monaghan, and the 4th Northern in South Armagh and South Down and Ireland. Now, the three parts of the plan, how did it pan out? The anti-treaty IRA did indeed send several hundred of their best monster veterans up to Donegal. Arming the Northern IRA, I argue, is one of the key elements of the Commons myth, and to get to the truth of it, you have to scratch below the surface. Now, guns were sent. There's absolutely no denying that. They were sent in quite limited quantities. So, for example, the three brigades in the 3rd Northern Division were only promised 150 rifles each. That would have given them guns enough for a third of the division. So the arms that were sent were in limited quantities. There were two routes for sending the guns up to the north, via Donegal and via, Dun uh, via Dundalk. <coughs> Here I do want to have a little digression because there's one parallel with 1969 which is just too juicy to resist. The guns that went up through Donegal were handed over to a Derry IRA officer named John Hawley. So you have arms being smuggled into the north for use by the Northern IRA with the participation of a man named Hawley, aided by officers in the army down here acting under orders from Dublin. <laughs> and to reinforce the point, Johnny Hawley was the father of Charlie. Some arms were swapped with, with the Munster IRA. So in the Civil War, you had the, the anti-treaty IRA <coughs> fighting with guns that in part had been given to the <coughs> provision government. Many of the arms that were promised by Collins actually failed to arrive or were seized by um, pro-treaty forces. The ammunition that was supplied to Belfast was only a third of what had been promised. And I came across instances in Sligo, Donegal and Belfast where rifles simply failed to show up. Most notoriously of all, <coughs> Duffy on the pro treaty side and Liam Lynch on the anti treaty had a public spat in the papers over who had failed to honour the bargain about sending weapons north. Now, if you're smuggling guns and you have a falling out with your partners, you don't argue the toss in the papers. <coughs> and that's why I have to laugh when you read some histories and reports, they talk about the Northern Ireland government received intelligence. 
So how did the Northern Offensive actually pan out? It was originally timed at the start of May. <coughs> now, interestingly, the Munster IRA were already in place in Donegal by the time the plan was unveiled to the Northern IRA. So you have to ask, what was the, the real purpose here? The Belfast IRA asked for a delay. It was originally timed to kick off on the 3rd. Um, the second Northern Division was supposedly too advanced in its preparations. So they went ahead with their, on the 3rd of May with attacks in Derry and Tyrone. The Munster IRA launched attacks from over the border in Donegal. In Belfast, the offensive began <coughs> on the 19th of May. Um, there was a raid on Musgrave Street Barracks in the city centre to capture some Lancia armoured cars, like the one in the photo on the, the top left hand side. They had actually got inside the barracks, secured the guardroom, seized the weapons, and were just about to start the Lancias when the alarm was raised, machine gun posts on the roof of the barracks opened up them, and they had to flee. Now, the reaction to the raid, there was a massive escalation in violence, and May was actually the worst single month in this whole two year two and a half year period for deaths um, in Belfast. Because the Second Northern had gone off too early, it meant that there was nothing else going on within the North, so they were able to flood Belfast with reinforcements from right across the North. So this meant that the Belfast IRA had to resort to an arson campaign, and you had the appearance of what was called in the papers the Falls Firebugs. On the 22nd of May, William Trudell, a Unionist MP who had been associated with the formation of the Imperial Guards, one of the largest militias, he was killed in Garfield Street in the city centre. Just on the bottom left hand side, you can see a lamppost. He was shot just next to that. As a response to that killing of an MP, internment was introduced. Back in March, the police had raided the truce liaison office of the IRA. <coughs> and seized documents. Now, the, the office wasn't in on the Falls or in a nationalist heartland. It was in St Mary's Hall, which is quite close to the city centre. Not a very well protected place to have your office, and not the place where you want to keep sensitive documents. Among the documents seized were attendance lists for who had attended IRA training camps the previous autumn. So this effectively gave the authorities a shopping list for who they were after when they introduced the tournament. Now, the third element of the plan, the IRA divisions along the border. What happened then? You've all heard about Owen McNeill's countermanded order before the Easter Rising. From the Bureau of Military History statements, we know that similar orders were sent to the border division. In Donegal, Daniel Kelly said, there was a general uprising in the plans for the North sometime in May 1922. All preparations for this rising had been made all over the six county area when instructions came to us to have it called off. And as the adjutant of the 4th Northern Division, John McCoy, said, at the last moment the rising on the 19th of May was cancelled. Orders to the effect came to us with only sufficient time to enable the operation to be called off. The head of the Provisional Government's Northeast Boundary Bureau, Kevin O'Shea, Quite frustrated, man said, while I was urging a policy of peaceful do-nothingness in Northern committees, the two branches of the IRA were actively making united preparations to invade the North East in alliance, and were only called off at the last moment because of some man's intervention. Tom Fitzpatrick was the OC of the Andrew Brigade in 3rd Northern Division. He said, the operation was countermanded, but the orders did not reach our division before we actually started fighting. My belief is the 3rd Northern Division was not sent a countermanding order. The reason I say this is a couple. For his statement to the BNH, um, most, in fact, most of the statements made by Northern veterans in the Bureau of Military History were gathered by John McCoy, the same man in the quotation there. McCoy knew an order had been received by the 4th Northern Division. My thoughts are that he then asked Fitzpatrick, what about the, the countermanding order? Um, and Fitzpatrick said it never came. More importantly, though, than this supposition, when the other divisions failed to mobilise, Roger McCauley, OC of the Belfast Brigade, came to see O'Duffy. And not only was he not reprimanded for disobeying the countermanding order, O'Duffy promised he would order out the 4th Martin Division into action. <coughs> never did. The countermanding order had to have come from somebody at least as high up as O'Duffy, who was the Chief of Staff at this point. 
Nobody else was senior enough to issue orders to IRA division commanders. So the key question is, would O'Duffy have issued such an order on his own without instruction from above? If the answer to that is no, then you have to ask, did Collins, Mulcahy and O'Duffy have ulterior motives? I said earlier on, they knew the, the loyalty of the Northern IRA was conditional. Go back to the treaty and the conditions that were imposed, the Army Convention and the auction for guns. Looking at the balance of forces in the split of the, the IRA, they needed to keep the Northern IRA, and especially the border divisions that were meant to take part in this offensive, were all pro-treaty. And these were some of the few trained, armed uh, forces that the provisional government could rely on. After the Northern Offensive. Some people say the intervention of the Civil War in the South removed support for the Northern IRA because in the South they were wrapped up in other things. My argument is that the Northern Offensive, which was effectively the last campaign of the War of Independence in the North, it had effectively failed by the end of June. To avoid internment, the Northern IRA largely fled over the border. And the Army Census of November 1922 is instructive. I hope, I'm not sure if you can all read this. I'll talk. The third name down from the top is a man called Henry Fife from Glen Ravelin, County Antrim. And this man was in the Antrim Brigade with my grandfather. The names either side of him are two of his cousins, also called Fife. And here you can see, maybe, that the three of them came down and joined the National Free State Army on the 14th of July. They enlisted in the Free State Army. If you look along the very top, you can see they're serving at the Curra as, and this is kind of indistinct, the 2nd and 3rd Northern Division. The IRA who fled over the border were largely kept in their own units in the Curra, ostensibly for retraining to go back into action in the north. Now, these men come down in July. The census, as you can see, was taken in November. So four months later, they're still kicking their heels in the Curra. So what happened in between? The end of July, Collins dispatched a, a secret envoy to the north, uh, the wonderfully named Captain Edmund Loftus McNaughton. And he was recommended to Collins as being from a family of pronounced orange views. This was a positive because he was basically told by Collins to go north and discover evidence that unionists were against partition. So this Walter Mitty character went up, spoke to cabinet ministers, business men, who I think basically laughed at their sleeves and told them what he wanted to hear. Are you opposed to partition? Yeah, but not just yet. In early August, the provisional government down here set up a subcommittee chaired by Ernest Blythe, who was originally from Antrim, originally um, a Presbyterian. Notably, it was not chaired by Collins. This subcommittee recommended an end to hostilities, accepting the treaty, recognising the Northern Ireland government, and disarming Northern nationalists. <coughs> On the 19th of August, the provisional government accepted these recommendations. Collins wasn't at that meeting with the government. He was down in Cork for his last fateful tour. The decision was communicated to him. But it was not communicated to the Northern IRA in the Cork. And during the rest of August through September into October, we've got this series of pleading, begging letters sent by Seamus Woods, who's by now the OC, asking the provisional government, what is your Northern policy? What are we supposed to do? We were promised this and we've gone nowhere. Not until the 20th of October did Richard Mulcahy, Minister for Defence, bluntly inform Woods, the policy of our government here with respect to the North is the policy of the treaty. And at the end of October, the IRA HQs left in Belfast and Antrim were closed down. The remaining officers and men came down to the Curra. And this, not the truth, was the end of the War of Independence in the North. Now, I want to finish just by taking an overview of the events. Firstly, what was the extent of the violence? <coughs> in the recent troubles in 1969, 3,526 people were killed over the course of 30 years. In two years, in 1920 and 22, 
498 people were killed in Belfast alone, and there was a further 180 across the rest of the world. If that rate of killing had lasted for 30 years rather than two, you would have had 10,000 deaths rather than the 3,500 that we have in the recent troubles. I said earlier on, up to the remobilization of the specialists, <coughs> fatalities in Belfast were almost 80, 80 nationalists, 84 unions. That was over the space of 16 months. In the 12 months over that, or after that, Catholics took the brunt of the, the violence. There were 200 nationalists killed as against 134 unions. So just to illustrate the degree to which the death toll fell on nationalists, there were 25% of the population in Belfast, but over 50% of the deaths. The other thing about the violence is the brunt of the violence fell on non combatants If you look at the deaths suffered by the British Army, the police, the specials, the IRA, they're all quite low. Between them, the adult took about 50. Civilians represented most of the casualties. Now, to an extent, that's not surprising because you had a lot of mob violence going on. You had snipers shoot, shooting from one side's area into the other, and so on. But the, the brunt of the violence fell on people who were non combatants second big question is, did the IRA protect nationalists? Mainly move on and look at who actually did the killing. And, and here we see some of the sergeants go. Now, firstly, we've got to acknowledge at this point that attributing responsibility for the killings is a little bit inexact because very often you read police reports, you read newspaper reports, and it says so-and-so was shot from the direction of such and such a street at uh, Nationalist Street, um, Unionist Street. So you can take for granted that some of the deaths attributed to Protestant civilians were probably committed by specials. Some of those attributed to Catholic civilians were probably um, carried out by the IRA. However, there's another point, and that is that on the Nationalist side, there was more competence than just the IRA. The AOH, led by Devlin, had plans, at least um, in an initial stage in November 1921, to form their own armed wing in response to the violence. These were to be called the Hibernian Knights. <coughs> More importantly, you have a very important role played by ex servicemen of the British Army who had been through the First World War, people who had been followed Redmond into the British Army to fight. In the South, I think there's a tendency to look at ex-servicemen as being the, the ones who filled up the Free State Army during the Civil War. The situation in the North and Belfast was very different. They fought alongside the IRA, and in fact, several of them became officers in the IRA. Tom Fitzpatrick, that I mentioned earlier on, had been a major in the British Army, and the commander of the IRA's B Company in Valley Carrot had also been an officer of the army, and in fact 40 of that company were British Army ex-servicemen, about a third of the total. You also had a very important role played by the British Army. You can see from the figures, they killed more people than the IRA. Now in his history of Northern Ireland, the Orange State, Michael Farrell said the army behaved with what he called fine impartiality. I don't think even Farrell realised how mathematical the impartiality was. They killed 35 Catholic civilians, 35, 34 Protestant civilians, and one A special who they had arrested and tried to get away from them. One thing to note is that the number of people who can identifiably, and I stress the word identifiably, killed by the specials is actually quite low. In, in the overall total. The evil reputation that the specials gained was probably more so from events outside of Belfast. Now, on the question of protecting Catholics, if you look at where the killings happened, West Belfast was a major concentration of nationalists and Catholics, and from the early riding in Clonard and afterwards along the falls, in the areas around the falls, the death toll was relatively low, considering that this was where the main concentration of nationalists was. Excuse me. It was also where the IRA in Belfast had been longest established. They had initially um, two companies which were in, 
entirely based along the fault road. So you could conclude that there was some success in providing defence in that area alongside the British Army and other nationalist groups. After the violence started in 1920, the IRA established isolated companies in Ardoyne on the top left, um, in Carrick Hill there in the middle where the number 66 is, in the markets and in Ballymacar. <coughs> Um, they also established a company in the more mixed area, up around where the 88 is, in North Green Street. Um, those were the areas where the violence was worst and the death toll was highest. And they point to an inability of the IRA to provide defence. And in those areas, Catholics made up up to two thirds of the deaths, a totally disproportionate number. The other cockpit of violence, if you like, was across the river in East Belfast in Ballymacarrow. And there there was 83 people killed. And this was the only district in Belfast, apart from the Fall Shankill interface, in which civilian casualties on the Unionist side were higher. And so generally, I would say, whatever the mythology around the IRA being the People's Defence Force, or whatever you want to call it, it had no um, foundation in the facts of what happened in 1920-22. Finally, could it have panned out differently? <coughs> As I said at the outset, you had the presence of two armed camps, so I think the fault line was there. Conflict was inevitable. As far back as 1912, a quarter of a million <coughs> Unionist men so signed the Ulster Covenant, pledging to resist home rule by all means which may be found necessary. Now, if they were going to resist home rule, they were certainly going to resist the war of independence in the establishing the Republic. Nationalism never really considered this question of unionist resistance. They viewed them as being British puppets. If the British go, well then the unionists will fall into line. They just <coughs> simply did not recognise that unionism had its own religious, political, economic reasons for wanting to stay in the British Empire. I mentioned about the imbalance of forces. It meant that Catholics were always going to carry a higher burden of the violence that did ensue. To illustrate that, in the middle of 1922, in the middle of the offensive, the Belfast Brigade of the IRA had 800 men, 181 rifles, and 380 followers. So, guns, despite Colin said, guns north, guns for half the men in the brigade. In Belfast, lined up against these 800, there was more than 2,600 RMC, nearly 27,000 specials, seven battalions of the British Army, about 7,000 troops, plus the militias and so on. Leaving aside the militias, the IRA was outnumbered more than 40 to 1, so failure was almost inevitable. Given that imbalance within the North, nationalists we're always going to need support from the South. And I would argue that the support they received was more, 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 well, sorry, more moral than material. The boycott that was instituted was ineffective. Um, Lies described it as having no more impact on northern trade than a shower would on Cape Hill. During the truce, McKelvey was constantly pleading with his GHQ for guns. Before and during the Northern Offensive, as I question marks at least over what assistance did Collins, Mulcahy and Duffy provide. So for those various reasons it was really no surprise that the War of Independence that the Northern IRA started in 1920 petered out and then being told by Mulcahy to accept the fate at the end of October 1922. <coughs> now I said that the rioting started in Valley Macarras in July 1920. On the 5th of October 1922, also in Ballymacarrow, a Catholic woman, Mary Sherlock, left her home in Duncan Street to go and buy food for the family dinner. She was standing at a counter at a butcher shop on the Newton Arts Road, and somebody walked up behind her and shot her in the back of the head. And Mary Sherlock had a dubious distinction of being the final fatality of what was known among nationals as a public. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to thank you very much for that talk. Uh, as usual, just to sum up, what well, is difficult to sum up because there was such a lot of, I think, new information and a lot of uh, insight in this talk. 
Um, I'm here to talk about the Northern conflicts during the Irish Revolution. Uh, unlike the Southern conflict, where civilians did suffer, uh, civilians were by far the majority, about three quarters of the victims of the Northern conflict. Um, here in the majority, the Catholics were disproportionately the victims, but not so disproportionate as you could call it um, a pogrom or a massacre. Um, the role of the IRA um, initially, here in his argument, had that the IRA was unprepared for sectarian violence. And later, he's argued that the southern government that was set up under the treaty uh, placed a greater priority on IRA unity than it did on its strategy in the North on uh, ending partition. And finally, the most, possibly the most controversial point, I think, is the, uh, the role of the northern state forces and to what extent they were responsible for attacks on civilians. So with that summing up, I'd like to open the floor to questions. Um, I'm going to... I'm going to take the advantage of having the chair to ask the first question. Uh, Kieran, uh, can you say something about how the IRA at the start, you said, didn't want to get involved in what they viewed as sectarian violence and went, progressed from that to basically some openly sectarian actions in 1922? It was, I think it was a process of necessity. Um, as I said, Seamus McKenna was a man who, in his statement to the Bureau, said we, we tried to stay aside from the usual fracture fracture side of the strife. They were being begged and pleaded by the population of the areas in which they lived to do something about this. The ex-servicemen in the initial stages played a prominent role. And they, they, some of the ex-servicemen were then recruited into the IRA. But it was really a, a case of backs against the wall. I mean, I talked about the, the tram attacks that were launched in November 1921. <coughs> the, these attacks were, were mounted on the shipyard workers because they came at the end of three days of constant attacks on St. Matthew's Church in what we now call Short Strand or then it's called Adam Carrot. And it was out of desperation and um, urgency to strike back that the IRA then mounted these sectarian attacks on the trans. Um, some of the, the older veterans who have been in the IRA from before the trouble started argued that because they basically threw the ranks open to all comers, um, that it meant the, if you like, the high Republican ideals of Catholic Protestant the centre were diluted and you had an influx of people who wanted revenge for attacks in their community. So that was an element to it. Um, you, it's a mixture of forces, I think. Desperation, um, people with different ideas being brought into the ranks, um, as much because of their ability to handle the gun, having served in the First World War, and less about um, how they viewed what the IRA was supposed to stand for. Kieran, I just ask, was there much of an exodus of the Catholic population into the 26 countries after that, during that time? And um, there were literally thousands came south. Um, from what I can make out, about a thousand to fifteen hundred stayed in the south of the college civilians. Um, a lot of them actually returned to their homes. Um, but you had as much as refugees coming down the south, you had a kind of a clustering within Belfast. So the Lower Falls and West Belfast generally, which were already nationalist areas, were flooded with refugees from other areas of Belfast. Um, you had house swaps going on, where you say a Catholic family living in the wrong area would swap houses with a Protestant family living in the wrong area. This happened to my grandfather's family. Um, you had massive overcrowding as a result in the likes of the Lower Falls. So. Um, a huge concentration of people. There was a lot of population movement. Most of it was within Belfast. Some people, obviously the ones who were burnt out of their homes, had um, few possessions to try and save and bring. They were the ones who came down. About 1,500 of them stayed down here. The rest actually went back home. Um, that was on the civilian side. On the IRA side, um, what's interesting to, when you read the, the accounts given to the Bureau of Military History, how many of the Northern IRA leadership stayed on 
and had careers in the National Army and the Defence Forces down here. So, for example, my granddad was a colonel in the Army. Um, Roger McCorley was a colonel. His brother Felix was a colonel. Um, Seamus Woods, briefly, at some point in 1922, was the Assistant Chief of Staff. Tom Fitzpatrick was an officer. There's a stream, when you read the a stream of the Northern veterans giving <coughs> testimony to the Bureau have got military rank, and that rank relates to their rank in the Army down here. Now, there were still arrest warrants out for a lot of them up to a couple of years afterwards. Bruce was actually um, arrested by the Northern government and interned. Ironically, he had been given a recruitment speech in a hall belonging to the AOH, who had been the, the Republicans' opponents. The police spotted him and interned him. Um, so they actually couldn't go back north because of the incident. Okay. Um, Sinn <coughs> um, Féin had actually realised were a minority within the minority of the, uh, the general election. What was the role of the of that one and the also during this whole time? <coughs> Up to the election of uh, May 1921, Devon and the, the Nationals were capital in. Were, were definitely the majority. Um, prior to the election, um, Devon Era and Devon agreed an election pact where they would put up an agreed number of candidates, um, they would give each other second preferences, and they agreed on the joint platform of abstentionism. And in that election, um, there were six MPs returned to the Northern Parliament from Sinn Féin, six from the National Party. In fact, it's five in the National Party because Devon won two seats. He won an Antrim and he won in Breath Belfast. Um, Which is normal at the time, but it would have been quite nice seats as well. After the, the treaty, and as you move into 1922, um, like they, both sides, both the Nationalists, Devon, and obviously Sinn Féin and Devon Era, adhere to the abstention, so they never attended meetings of the Northern Parliament. Actually, Lynn de Valera was elected to Stormont in the 1930s, but again, they didn't take the seat. But they didn't take the seats in the Northern Parliament. After the signing of the treaty, um, effectively, Devlin and the Hibernians were sidelined. They were, they were in the wilderness. They couldn't go or wouldn't go into the Northern government. and. They were kept on the sidelines by the provisional government down here. In the middle of April 1922, um, Collins called a, a meeting of a North East Advisory Committee, which was constituted pretty much the whole of the provisional government down here. Um, three bishops and ten priests from the North, um, the leaders of the IRA, and notable figures from Sinn Féin in the North. So you have Northern clergy, politicians, and IRA, the Southern provisional government, Devlin and Hibernians were simply not invited. So they remained sidelined. And this was a, a, a deliberate ploy of Collins. Yeah. First of all, thank you for your very for this and talk. Um, you, you mentioned about in the very comes rotten cross in Dumbledown and Shipyards. And that prompts me to ask, what part, if any, did the Labour movement play in this whole uh, situation? Did they surface at all? Not really. Um, my own view is that part of the reason for the, the, call it, the low level of Labour movement trade unions, you know, there had been a very significant strike in 1919 of engineering workers in Belfast. And there was all sorts of reports of a Soviet having been declared and Bolsheviks in control of Belfast because they were basically they were running the gas company and power and so on. They printed their own paper. The strike eventually went down to defeat. Um, in the nineteen twenty elections, you did have what was called labour unions standing, um, who would, if you like, be described as the left wing within unionism. Um, there was one very famous character called Tommy Anderson, um, who held, what was it, I think in the 1960s, the, the world record for a speech made in Ireland, where he spoke for 10 hours in a meeting and so on. It was a filibuster. 
But he was a unionist first and foremost. After that, he had nothing to do with the official unionist party. He was out there, he was from uh, <coughs> MP from the Schenkel, um, but he was very strongly a unionist man. But my interpretation is that after the defeat of the 1919 strike, the, the Labour tide fell down. Now they did, as I say, stand Labour unionist candidates in some areas in Belfast. They were very much under the umbrella of unionism, and it was effectively a front to make sure that the voters stayed in the unions camp. Here were some palatable left-wing-ish people who were still safe because of the unions. Um, I think it was the 1924 election, you did have Labour MPs returned um, from the Northern Parliament, but in the events that I've been talking about, the, the union movement was, was largely outside of it. Um, I talked about the, the overcrowding and so on, and like there was a, a massive amount of houses being burned. And one of the things that struck me when I was researching this was during 1921, there was actually a strike of building workers that went on for about three months in Belfast. At a time when you would think the demand for housing would be huge, but this strike went on, and it happened completely outside, we call it, the, the national events um, that we talked about. So if, if there was labour unrest going on, it was almost at a subterranean level. Okay, I, yeah, <coughs> just to say the, um, the you know, we used Stormont as a kind of shorthand, but the parliament itself wasn't located in Stormont, it was the no. uh, your, foot, it, your foot is the university area. It was, it was in the Presbyterian assembly rooms. Yeah. <coughs> just, just down the road from Queen. Stormont yeah. wasn't built until which I think is 1935 or something. My question was that, uh, you know, looking back now, you can see the tradition well embedded and so on. But at, at the time, to what extent was it all seen as a temporary? I mean, how soon did the boundary discussions did it become clear that they were going, going nowhere, as it were? I think uh, there was two, two parts to that. One, I think people expected the boundary commission to meet quite soon after. And there was actually a border commission had been established, and after the breakdown of the second pact, um, the unionists withdrew from participation. And they vehicles with a blue and white flag on them going along assessing border area. Where was the border? And who was here? And all the rest of it. They expected the border commission to report a lot quicker. It didn't eventually report until 1925. And the expectation all along, and this goes back to the ins and outs of home rule and how much of us will be excluded, will it be four counties, six counties, nine counties, will it be county by county to vote or what way? Um, everybody assumed on the national side that the, the treaty said in, in accordance with the wishes of the local inhabitants and in some little catch about economic and something. Um, the catch was this thing in the tail, but everybody thought, right, more nationalists in Fermanagh and Tyrone, they come south, along with other majority nationalist areas. In fact, the, the meeting that I mentioned in Clonus the night after the treaty, McKelvey came dancing out and told his quartermaster that West Belfast could vote itself out of Northern Ireland if it wanted. <laughs> now, he obviously misunderstood how the border was shaped, like, contiguous areas with the South McKelvey thought West Belfast would be free. You know? So the expectations on the national side were A, that it would be quicker, and B, that it would give enough territory to the South as to render Northern Ireland unviable. By the time it did meet, um, the Free State Government had other priorities, and then there was the whole embarrassment of the revelation of the report and there's actually more territory being given to Northern Ireland for Eastern Province of what we said about right, okay. We'll bury the report, have everything as it is now, and we'll take away some of the reparations um, that were in the treaty. Yeah, that's a couple more questions about it. Well, my my position that uh, I'm extremely hostile to the start to finish. Mm -hmm. I think it's totally inappropriate, you know, uh, to the situation. Uh, I'm talking about 1980 on, I'm not talking about the earlier chapter. For instance, it was totally inappropriate. The whole thing was a disaster. A 
cascading disaster. It was like a, a watch, like an intricate thing, and these people had no power to do it. It was totally inappropriate. Even in the cell, it wasn't very appropriate. I, I heard, I think I was, I was the first thing from the here, a lot of not to a lot of might have been wrong, not in office. And I just recently, only recently, I heard of two, uh, I knew some serious sectarian incidents, but I thought they were, you know, I thought they were minimum, but I, I found out recently of two other serious things. The interesting point there is that, why wasn't we told, you know, when I thought I'd be involved in this set of the I wasn't told, so I assumed that the whole place, that there was this era of military, but there was land grabbing fellas, for instance, shooting the soldiers, uh, taking on soldiers, were land grabbing, because the soldiers hoped to get preference for land. And land grabs so on like that, sectarianism. But then, a few points I'd make about it. The first thing is, in, in connection, I, I, I would go back to the plantation of Ulster, actually. I think that's the crucial thing. Because I think that you can more easily, you can more easily see the thing, what's going on. The big, big drifts of like, I won't go out of my tank with that, I'll take off too much of time. But uh, I say about this about, about the, the 1916 period. They, they, in 1916, not only were they told, were the, the, the volunteers told to leave the Belsfeld fellows, told, told to go to the Galway. And the South Arna told to go to the Boyne and to go south of the Boyne and not to fire a shot. Don't take my And they were incredulous. The priest would say, What are you mad? Okay, respond My main point is this. Why did they say, why did they look, why did they look, why did they want independence at all? What was the whole thing under that? Well, okay, Karen. <laughs> so the second one. Um, yeah, I, the reason I didn't go back to the plantation is big place, because we had three courses in our from the state. <laughs> they were all nice <laughs> otherwise. Um, as far as Sinn Féin, um, I think for a number of reasons, like why did Sinn Féin come to prominence at all? in the south or in the north, and it goes back to the, the execution of the leaders after 1916, probably more so, and this is referred to equally by the testimony of the, the northern veterans, the impact of the conscription crisis in 1918. It was absolutely massive. In actual fact, I can't remember the, name, the guy's name, there was one of the Tyrone IRA statements uh, given to the Bureau of Military History talks about members of the UVF joining the IRA during the conscription crisis because it looked like the Republicans struck Sinn Féin struck IRA were the ones who were most going to resist conscription and they didn't want to be conscripted. So the UVF joined the IRA. And this, this was one of the, not in its entirety obviously, this was one of the major mobilizing factors was the conscription crisis. And the fact that the Nationalist Party in the South had largely shot its boat because of Red and the war and so on, in the North, as I keep saying, it was different. Devon was like a Tammany Hall owner of West Belfast. He dispensed privileges, he dispensed jobs. People would come up to him and give him presents in the street, factory girls who owned their living to him and so on. One thing that really struck me is Devon died in. 1934, I can't remember which month. At that point, the Irish News, which was the nationalist paper, um, still had the death notices on the front page. And there's columns and columns and columns of tributes to Devlin as head of the AOH from different branches of the AOH. And this pouring forth of tributes to Devlin went on for weeks. What I would say about Sinn Féin generally and the North, they simply didn't think about it. It wasn't until during the treaty negotiations that De Valera asked Erskine Childers to come up with a policy for Sinn Féin and how they should approach the North. During the closed session of the Dáil in August of 1921, De Valera said that if they could get the Republic from the treaty negotiations, he would be in favour of each county having the right to vote out. In other words, they weren't this famous phrase of De Valera's, we are not doctrinaire Republicans, they weren't doctrinaire 32 counties either. They were prepared to let parts of the North go if they got the treaty. So Sinn Féin was all over the shop in relation to the North. I argue that Collins was all over the shop in relation to the North. He was, at the end of July, he had the IRA trained for resuming operations. 
He had the, the daft Captain McNaughton going up and talking to unionists. There was the provisional government subcommittee, so he had three strands going on. And McCollins, or Collins' northern policy was all over the place. So I think there was a misunderstanding of the nature of unionism, and there was a failure to come to grips, mentally, intellectually, whatever, with it. Sinn Féin had its own reasons for growth, but the, the two were never going to come together. Okay, well, that's question. Yeah. Yeah, um, well, I think I agree they didn't know that possibly partly it was uh, uh, they, they didn't uh, want to know because, in my opinion, as we're seeing today, the, the, the unionism and loyalism probably is uh, <coughs> uh, uh, very difficult to uh, read. Uh, uh, one of the basic things about it is quite simply anti Catholicism, uh, uh, you know, which is uh, you know, the basis, in fact, one of the Bases on which uh, the uh, uh, the industries of Belfast were built, but uh, but I'm talking of these industries, I think you, you say that it was uh, simply mob violence. I'm not so sure that it was started by mob violence. I'm not so sure. I mean, uh, there was Carson's uh, July the twelfth speech, which was an indirect incitement, etc. Uh, but also that was merely the culmination of a number of speeches that had been made by leading unionist politicians uh, over the years, particularly after, uh, uh, over, in, fact, over, in fact, ever since the uh, local elections, when and uh, the local elections had returned uh, independent Labour, made in, the independent Labour Party in uh, Belfast, uh, um, the second party in Belfast, the uh, nationalists uh, were very much the third by that time. I think we should also remember that uh, the, the rising out of the strike that you mentioned in 1919, uh, there were two factors there, two things, demands were being raised by the shipyard work, workers' unions. First was for the uh, five pound a week, the five pound a week wage, and uh, also the second one was uh, for the 44 hour, 44 hour week. Um, and I, uh, it's perhaps significant that uh, there was agreement on the eve of uh, the pogroms, um, the, on the eve the, uh, that, uh, uh, that the, the, the discussions would begin on the 44-hour week, and that on the very day of the pogroms began, um, the uh, a discussions on the five the, the five pound week wage uh, had broken, broke down irrevocably. So I think there is, uh, seems to be a certain uh, connection here. Okay. Uh, and, and, and would you say, but would you not say that basically the only people who really, who actually benefited from um, this, uh, from the, the programs were precisely the uh, boss class in, the, in the, well, in Ulster. No, okay. okay. Um, when, when you look at the history of the North over a longer span than, than what I remember, there have been sectarian rioting in Belfast, I think, every decade since the 1850s. And in fact, the longest sustained period of peace that Belfast had seen was prior to 1969. There had been no rioting of, we call it Belfast scale rioting, since 1935, so you had 40 odd years of peace. Prior to that, you have had sectarian rioting every decade. Um, on the other side, you had the 1919 strike, which I mentioned. There had also been a strike in 1907, led by Jim Larkin, who had organized the Belfast Stock Workers. You even had the police on strike in 1907. But I would argue that both 1907 and 1919 were aberrations in the normal pattern of events in the North. Now, as regards who was the, the long-term beneficiaries, yes, the, the unionist um, upper class, the, like Craig was from the whiskey distillery only family, they were the ones who benefited most. Um, there were subsidiary benefits had to be handed down to their grassroots supporters in terms of job discrimination and so on to keep them on board with their 
their leaders. Um, so to the extent that they were, as I think it was in Canada described it as, it was the top of his head and looking down on top of us. So from that point of view, Protestant working class people were slightly better off, or put it another way, Catholic working class people were even worse off than Protestant working class people, but they didn't really benefit in the way that we would use the word benefit. Um, but they were kept within the union of Sundreda um, and their lives to maintain. I want to squeeze one final question. There's no sign that those who are born in the state history are condemned for them. And I think it's interesting to compare what went on in Northern Ireland with what's happening now in Eastern Europe. Um, it's funny, the, the same thought struck me um, earlier this, this morning when I was reading newspapers about what's going on in the Ukraine and trying to figure out well, Ukrainian nationalists versus Russian nationalists and obviously thinking about the North. And the conclusion that I keep coming back to is that nationalism, whether it be in Ukraine, Russia, in Ireland, and I would include nationalism in that context as encompassing British nationalism on the Delighted side, nationalism really doesn't do people any good in Ireland. Okay. Okay. On that note, thank you very much.